Hi everybody and welcome back to the Bear Tapestry Recreation Project. Uh, today we're starting the filling. Yes, we're getting there. Um, I say that a lot, don't I? Sorry, but we are. We're starting the filling today. Uh, just before we get going though, uh, just to let you know that I've recently uploaded a video, a how-to video that shows you uh, the five stitches used across the whole of the Bear Tapestry, including the filling stitch from the front and from underneath. Uh, People have also asked questions linked to that um, and I'll be trying to answer some of those during this video as well. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, so today we're going to start with this swirl here and um, what's, what's interesting is that um, obviously these are quite um, difficult shapes with for the stitch that we're going to be using but um, the original embroiderers actually would have divided areas up so um, it looks like this area was divided up along here or along there let me just double check yeah so kind of along up that way so we will do the same so the this stitch is made up of um, three different layers of stitching um, helps if I put the knot underneath doesn't it um, so we're, I'm going to start here because that will give a nice angle from which for us to work from okay so your base layer um covers the whole of the ground fabric and I'm just working now <clears throat> the original excuse me the original embroiderers didn't necessarily do it like this but for this stitch I'm just working from the middle out and then I'll go up back up to the top in order to get a nice line um, and you find that the original embroiderers worked um, these first layers um, in mainly from one side to the other um, in fact let's do that because we're trying to be accurate aren't we so let me undo this and we'll work from one side to the other and you do find sometimes that oh, that while nowadays we would like our, our lines of stitching um, to be to all run at the same nice angle the way across that actually on the original that happens a lot but in some instances they do swing a little bit and that it could be argued that that's because they didn't start in the middle and went one way and then the other and so had that guiding line in the middle but they started at one end and then it just sort of concerted it out naturally as they went which is I find that happens with me quite a bit um, so someone mentioned, and I'm really sorry, I've forgotten names, but someone mentioned about instead of cutting my thread off all the time, um, to dampen it, and that should help with the, um, with re-threading it. So here we go. Let's see if this works. And this, oh, look at that. Genius. Thank you. Brilliant idea. So that saves me licking it and cutting the thread. Okay, and we're going to start working properly now, as they would have done. Okay. I don't know what... I've been doing um, some kit samples and things recently, so I think I was probably in the frame of mind, like, you've got to make it perfect for the kit sample. Right. So with this stitch, you create your first stitch going over the top but like satin instead of like satin stitch where you'd come back to the beginning you actually come up to create your next row directly next to where you took the thread down like this and this is how you create your rows don't pull them too tight because if you pull them too tight the thread gets it extends and it gets thinner and therefore oh you see I'm already going off at an angle and it doesn't give us good coverage on the ground fabric um, 
you just want to gently have it gently laid down. Oh, I've got a knot. No, get into the front. Oh, knots. What's going on? Here we go. There we are. Oh no, and this happens a lot as well. You bring it back up through the hole that you've just taken the thread down, which is quite irritating. Right. So with it, by doing um, laying the thread this way, you're not wasting as much thread. I say wasting in um, inverted commas as much thread on the back. So there's not so much thread that won't be seen but uh, what you do find is the way this the thread now lies is um, it can splay out so in tight small areas maybe like this one or these down here you'll find the t the the base layer of thread will um, sit over your outline stitch but that's okay because you um your second layer of stitching and your third well, but the second layer in particular brings it all back into um into the correct position so whereas with satin stitch because you're laying the threads in really in one direction front and back and you don't um they don't tend they sit uh nice more they sit nicely, they don't splay out like that. And so you um and you see so you get a different finish. So what you see is that I'm just creating this base layer here, and when you work it, you can squish the threads back with your needle as you're working it. Um, I'm angling the needle underneath at a 45 degree angle underneath the outline stitches and you find this um, across the original hanging um, and you can see that the these um, stitches sometimes go through the thread the outline thread um, on the back and that's how they catch the fibres and that's how we know that these were worked after well one of the reasons we know why that these were worked after the um uh the outline so you'll see that i'm actually using quite a long piece of thread here this is a meter length and if you remember in the first video i did i was explaining why i chose a certain length of thread and it's big um so the outline stitch is the stem stitch and the thread goes through the fabric quite a lot as you're working it as you're making creating the stitch and so um it wears the fibres of the thread down and I found that um, around 40 centimetres works quite well in most cases um, before the thread becomes the structure becomes um, so inconsistent that it's not it does you can't really use it anymore it doesn't look good but we're experimenting with um this stitch because as you can see the thread doesn't go through the ground fabric as much and so the wear the rubbing the friction of the um thread as it passes through the fabric isn't as um intensive and so hopefully the structure of the thread will stay good for longer and um, we can use longer lengths of thread and um, this is also a good thing because not in this instance but when we get to these long sweeping areas down here and maybe on the trees and definitely on the boat we'll have longer bigger areas to fill with this base fabric and if you were using 40 centimeters of thread then it would um, you'd be forever stopping and changing thread which is not good uh, 
timing wise. The other thing that's not good timing wise at the moment is the fact that I'm only using my dominant hand to um, stitch this. Uh, and the reason for that, is, well, there's a number of reasons. One is, um, and the main one is that I'm actually working quite high up the frame at the moment. And with the thread being longer, I just felt more comfortable and more in control if I was using my dominant hand on both. But as the thread is now getting a little bit shorter, we let's see how we go. So you can see that as I've worked up this bit here, I've done a neat ish <laughs> uh, diagonal line and you find these kind of lines you some you find them it varies but you find them diagonally going across to create a, um, a more of a hidden line but sometimes on horses for example you'll see maybe the line goes directly from an end point across um, now whether that's to do with this the embroiderer making the decisions or it's to do with the uh, the motif that's been worked or a combination of the two um, is something that need, I need to investigate. Gosh, the tapestry just keeps on giving, doesn't it? Right, so we're getting to the top on this bit. So thank you everybody who's been watching, liking and commenting on, um, on the videos. That's really great. I have tried to answer everybody's video, um, sorry, comment. Um, and then, but if I've missed yours, it's not on purpose. Uh, I don't know, it's the vagaries of YouTube and my working, um, my understanding of how these things work, I think. Um, so this, so if you look at this thread now, it looks like it's butting right up to the outline, but I always just took another one in because when you put your next layer of stitching over the top, you'll find that these constantine are in quite a bit. And sometimes you get a little bit of the um, ground fabric showing and that irritates me. So I'm just going to pop another stitch in. Uh, let's see how, that, yeah, that'll be fine. It's just, right. So our next layer of stitching on this bit is, um, it's worked, always works at 90 degrees to, um, your base layer. So as this one was horizontal, we're going to work the second layer, uh, vertically. And, um, I'm going to do that now. start here I think just get down here like that there we go and you this is what you find um, on the hanging is that they do stick to this that where they break off and change direction of the base layer they also change the direction of the uh, the upper layers so um, they do work this um, strictly, I suppose. It's a way you could um, sew it. Right, so I've laid this out to try and get um, the angle of the thread right. And then I've just angled my needle um, underneath the outline thread like that pull it and you can see that it's drawing that baseline in there and then you go across to the next space i think that's about right is it maybe a bit further about there yeah and you work it the same way and you see this across the hanging the evidence for it. Of course, they're hanging front and back. So that's good. Yeah. There we go. 
So um, people have been asking um, on the back of previous videos, but also um, the one I've just released about which shows the five different stitches um, about how long you would make your base layer of stitching and across the there's no strict answer to this across the hanging you see different varying lengths so for example and I think it's to do with the shape of the motif more than anything really so for example on the ships where you've got the long planks um, and they're fairly straight the threads run for quite all the way along the straight areas um, but where you have um, perhaps trees or um, uh, say animals where they want to show the muscles and, and things or these kind of um, shapes sinuous shapes which are quite curvy you they break the they break the areas up more um, to make it I think well a number of reasons to make it easier to stitch but also so that it looks nicer um, when it's finished as well so there's no um, easy answer for that um, question and because, as I said earlier, this base layer can splay out over your outline stitches, but your this next second layer that we're working now brings it all back in again. It doesn't matter it really if the threads on your long, say your ship areas, they splay out over the outlines because you're going to draw them back in. Um, it's a really versatile stitch in that sense. Okay, here we go. So. We've got our, there we are. Oh, that's looking good, isn't it? Right. So, and also people have been asking about distances between these um, stitches on your second layer. I always go with instinct. And I think that's what happened on the original bear tapestry because you see um, the in different areas or around um, one of the seams for example you can see that somebody's wet at the top and somebody else is wet at the bottom and there's a difference in the in the way the distance between these um these stitches and i think it's instinct on what the embroiderer thinks works well for the area that they're covering but what i would say is um i wouldn't say stitch one here and then one there and miss that one out in the middle because that's too for me personally that's too big a distance so in this smaller area you need them fairly close together to give that um so you can see the stitch really and it's the same with this third layer of stitching that we that they put on so this always goes in the same direction as your base layer like this over the top and then your next row, it's um, it's like a brick wall, really. And this is filling in the um, cement in between your bricks. Just directly over like this. And this just holds it all in place. It's really clever. Use this little thread because you've got so little thread on the back but it's really effective. And it's a quick stitch to work as well. Well, <laughs> I say that so she go really slowly, that it's normally a quick stitch to work. So you can imagine that if someone has a deadline, a quick deadline that they've got to get things done, that this is a good stitch to choose. It covers the fabric well, and it's bold. So worked in wool, it's a really bold stitch, so it's good for hangings and big areas. It's like um, working, uh, making altar frontals for big cathedrals or big churches nowadays. You need those big, bold, applique designs. Although you might be tempted to do beautiful little um, delicate stitches, they don't show up at a distance. There we go. So we've got our bricking effect there. And now I'm going to work 
down this way. And I'm just going to check that the angle is Okay, so it's not straight, it follows the line, the direction of the, um, this. That means I need to go here with this one. There we go. Oh, I don't like that. Wet cloth. <laughs> I'm just um, doing, this works really well, thank you for this. Uh, somebody else was asking um, that on the, oh look at that, genius. Someone was asking um, on the, from the other video actually, I start the threads off with knots, and yes I do because that's how it's done on the bed tapestry, I don't always do that. Um, and how do I finish them? Well, generally, if I was just working um, a, a normal piece, I would just do a couple of, either a couple of little holding stitches like you would normally do, or I'd bring the thread along the back and then bring it up further down so that later stitching um, will hold it in place. And it's that latter um technique that they used they used on the um the bear tapestry so they would um pass uh either pass the ends of threads through areas that had already been worked on the back or they would um just bring the thread down and pull it through to the front and then it would be caught by later threads so that's um, how they did it. The 19th century restoration work, however, um, they just left bundles of threads hanging loose on the back. You can see on the photos these knotted areas and bundles of thread just hanging there. And as a researcher, it's so tempting to go, oh, can I just snip a bit to go and analyse it? But obviously I never do that. Making a bit of a mess of this bit, aren't I? It's not lying very well. Hmm. Oh well, I'm sure the original work has had the same problem. Let's get that on here. See how this goes, if it goes any better. There we are. It's a bit better, isn't it? And I might have to just go and fill that bit area in there. So the bear tapestry, uh, we think, was worked in around 1070, 1071. Um, and the embroidery on it, I know in the past people have said, oh, it's not as amazing as Opus Anglicanum. Well, and that's because there's a number of reasons, things going on there. Partly because Opus Anglicanum has always been seen as the high point of um, medieval embroidery and I understand that I'm not necessarily I'm not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing with it um, but opus anglicanum, and opus anglicanum is also finer because it's silk threads and gold and things like this uh, whereas wool is by its very nature more chunky um, and so Oops, the use of those kind of comments aren't really very helpful uh, because they're not accurate, really. They're not taking into account the different nature of the materials being used or what the things, the objects that are being made. So vestments and things like that, church vestments, and yet you can have nice, pretty, delicate designs on them and they look fantastic. I mean, they won't, might not necessarily be seen 
by people further back in the congregation, but that that's a different story. Whereas things like the Bay Tapestry is a wall hanging and it's meant to be seen from a distance. It's got to have impact in that way. And they're telling a story. The messages aren't meant to be subtle. It's like a cartoon. And I think that's where some people in the past have got confused and they say oh it's not as elegant but it's a cartoon it's telling you a story and it actually does the job very well and if you look at the way the stitching has been worked it's very professional they knew what they were doing this is the point I'm trying to make I know it's quite a long-winded one but it's the fact that these stitchers knew what they were doing and so therefore they were practiced in using these kind of threads and these particular stitches for this kind of artwork. And so while the bear tapestry has quite rightly garnered lots of attention and, um, and that sort of for various reasons, it wouldn't have been unique. These people knew, these embroiderers knew how to manipulate the threads and use them and what stitches to use in order to get across the message, the stories that oh, they were trying to tell. And we do have documentary evidence from the period that talks about, sorry, I'm just concentrating, other hanging, hangings being made by woven or um, embroidered by people. Don't always talk about the materials they're using, but you can, but from the descriptions, you get the idea that they would have been similar to the bear tapestry. And we also have um, hangings, I mean, the Osberg ship burial ones are the most famous. They're woven. Um, but it shows that this type of stitching was well known, it was well practiced, and what was being achieved here had a long tradition, both in early medieval England and um, in other territories such as Scandinavia and places like that. So I think that's a really important point. Okay, so we've done our base layer. You can see this is hanging over a little bit here, but that's fine. And we've got, we got right to the end of the thread. So that's really good. So what I'm going to do is just bring the end of that thread up there. And to start the next layer, I'm going to actually use this thread that um, was left hanging from previously. Where's my thread? Here we go. There we are. Perfect. Oh, I shouldn't have said that just yet. Yes, now I can say perfect. There we go. Take this to the back. Right, now we'll start at this end. So we have, um, I know I've mentioned this in other videos, we have surviving um, pieces. Oh, no, far too close. A bit further. When, when the stitches worked at an angle, I always think, oh, no, I must put the next layer of stitching here, and it's always too close. There we go. The angle can be deceptive. Um, we have surviving pieces worked in wool. The next um, piece dates to the 12th century um, and was found stuffed into um, a church in Rune uh, in Norway and it's just a fragment and tantalising, it doesn't show much, but tantalisingly it's so similar to uh, the bear tapestry in so many respects, it's really interesting. Um, I'd, I need to go over at some point and have a look at it. And then um, 
there are a number of surviving pieces later again um, from Iceland and um, the, they were using this stitch in wool right the way through the middle um, ages and you see it survives loss on things like ultra frontals and things like this and then later in the period they started adding gold thread um, to it so that adds a different layer different level of texture and visual um, storytelling to um, to the the work which I find fascinating Ooh, shall I pop another one in there no I don't think I will um, and then um, but in England uh, you find um, the next surviving example is uh, worked in silk and it was found on um, some a fragment of embroidery that I've managed to been very lucky I've managed to um, analyze and publish on it I'll put the link to that chapter um, in the comments section for you in the description sorry um, and that's worked in silk and you can see that it's becoming more like the type of laid in couch work that you see worked on pieces of Opus Anglicanum um, so you can see this development occurring in the stitch which is um, I find really interesting I like the fact that these stitches people continue to work them in the traditional way but they weren't static they uh, they evolved and I, I like that because it tells you about materiality the way people were thinking and working evolution of techniques and technologies and um, development of material culture and cultural ideas as well and I just think that's really fascinating Hi, we're doing well I say that I've not actually looked at the time <laughs> I know I'm, I'm working quite slowly today uh, let's see if I can get this thread to the very bitter end well it's not bitter end is it very end we'll get there so you can see that these threads are lasting a lot longer um, on this stitch because it's not as I mentioned at the beginning not wearing through the fabric um, as because it doesn't pass through um, quite as much so I'm just going to bring this thread down here and that will be caught by the next area oh I'm quite pleased with that I think that looks good right so the next area we're going to work is um, this piece here um, and that is ooh, in the light blue and actually because this area is so small I think we can get away with the short length of thread too so we'll see Alright then. Oh, I've not done my saucer trick. Well, it's not my saucer trick. <laughs> there we go. Uh, someone was asking about magnifying glasses uh, or magnifiers. That's um, a really interesting point, and I'm not just saying that. Sorry, I have this be in my bonnet about particularly when politicians or, or but other people as well are asked questions they go oh that's a really interesting question you're just like oh just answer the question stop patronizing people um but in this instance it is a really interesting question because um the size oh dear the size of the stitching particularly on things like gold work and things like that 
are um, they're minute. I mean, if you go and look at uh, watch some of my um, videos on the Cuthbert Recreation Project, you'll see what I mean. Let me just check the area, the angle. Yep. So we're going this way for start this one, um, and. Not all embroidery workers could have been, would have been short sighted and therefore able to see these um, those stitches without help. We've got no evidence really as such for um, magnifiers, but you do find evidence of um, crystal um, in different contacts a lot of them um, particularly the appeared in burials that have been are thought or definitely known to have been female burials um, and there's some evidence for viking um, sailors um, when they went off a vikinging um, or even just trading um, having flat um, crystals rock crystal that they used um, possibly for magnifying and for seeing long into long distances and things like that. So this is an area that's not really been researched and it's one that I want to uh, look into because I think it could be very interesting and tell us quite a lot about how um, embroidery workers, um, some of their working methods during the period. Uh, so bear with me on that, it's yet another project. Um, you really need about 20 lifetimes in order to cover all these different projects, don't you? Which is good in one sense, because you know that it will never be over. You'll be always telling and tweaking the story. Okay. So this is the light blue, and I'm only using 40 centimetres of thread here because this is such a small area. I uh, just thought, well, you won't necessarily need to use a whole metre. And because this blue is only used sparingly in this section, instead of um, then wasting the rest of that metre, it's more economical, etc., to use the blue. So it's shorter length. Right, so we've filled that area in and we're going to just do the next layer. There we go. Oh, I've done that thing where you end up lining up your second layer across um, motifs or elements within a motif. You don't really see that on the bed tapestry. You do occasionally, but not very often. Um, and I don't like it because, to me, it makes it then look as if the pattern is just following round, and that's not necessarily meant to be the case. But anyway. Done it on this one. I do like this blue thread because it's been dyed, hand dyed naturally, and you can see the variations in tone across it. Just looking to see if mm, hopefully it's picking up on the camera. And you see these variations in tone across the um, original hanging as well. There we go. Now that was a bit quicker. Oh, that's not very good, is it? Now, on the original, you do see one, what I would call wonky stitches like that. So I'm just being a bit over the top precise, I think. Right. So 
for this area, this just to remind you that this area is heavily restored. Um, but where there are colours, I am trying to follow those. Um, but in other areas, for example, this bit hasn't been filled in at all. And I've actually, um, it's this area is quite, it's restored. Um, and they've used the pale, the fawn colour for the restoration. But this area, bit of it here hasn't been restored. And that is in the brown and that's why I've used the brown on this particular bit um, and what you find on the there we go oh looking good and you can see I don't hopefully you can you can see the variation in tone on that and that gives it a really um, dynamic feel I think I quite like that it's, well I quite like it I really like it I think that looks um yeah I think that looks good with those different um tones within the one it's a bit like a variegated thread isn't it right sorry back to the thing. so this area here hasn't been filled but like I say uh, it's been re quite heavily restored with the form, but there's a bit of original stitching down here, which is in this brown, which is why I've used that colour. Um, and then further down, I'm just trying to see. Yeah, all those areas are um, restored, really. So, hmm, I think I'm going to leave those areas for now, and we'll see how we go see what's best maybe well maybe you can give me your thoughts on this do I just leave that as it is because there's no evidence for what color thread um, was used um, because um, now um, or do you think I should make an executive decision and jump in there with a color and fill it in give me your thoughts on that I'd be interested to hear them um, and this bit here is the same, actually. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to move to this back to this bit. So that's brown. We do know what that one is. Let's see if I can thread it without using the magic water. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. Put a knot in the end. So we're doing really well because, I mean, we're just over half an hour-ish. Let's have a look. Well, nearly more 40 minutes now. But we've done quite a lot of filling compared to where we were on the stem stitch. We're doing um, well. Let me have a look at the uh, angle. Yep, so it's just following the flow, the, the way it would have grown there. Um, and then this bit here uh, swishes off to that, that direction. So uh, we'll start here. Try and get the angle right. And that bit up there didn't need any extra stitching in the end, did it? So that's quite good. Right, so we're back to using a metre thread because it's um, quite a big area. We'll see how oh, that goes. Need to try and catch in some of these loose threads, uh, ends of threads even, as we go along. Could that have gone down further? Maybe. We'll see. It's always these decisions on these um, acute angles. Have you gone down far enough? Are you pushing the outline out of the way? Ugh. Or are you okay? Wow, this is a long thread. I wouldn't normally use a metre of um, thread. And I've got Oh gosh, I've got 
memories just pop into my head about the RSN apprenticeship where <laughs> this happened in the first year if they thought you were using too long a thread your teacher would go along and snip the end snip it off to the right length which at the time is a good way of learning actually no. I don't know if they do that now on the um, on the uh, what's the new apprenticeship, the teaching the teaching to teach course. I'll have to ask somebody. I see. Oh, I'm not happy with that. That's, will it go in? Yeah, I think we'll be okay. I think I'm just being too precise. The original is very neat and it is very precise, but if you look at it microscopically, which I've been um, allowed to do, so I've been very lucky, you do find that actually in when you look, it's not always 100% accurate. And you can understand that. I mean, it's a massive hanging. Right, let's chop these browns off. Uh, scissors. It's a massive hanging. They've got to get it done. There's a lot to do. So you don't know if they were working to a tight time scale or, or any of these other conditions. So yeah. And also when you're looking at the whole thing, um, you don't notice those areas because your eyes are taken to the action and the stories that are being told on the scenes. Um, it's only people like me who come and look at it what, so many centuries later. Which actually does make me think when I'm doing my work, is someone gonna come and look at my work in so many centuries later and go, oh, she said this, because we've got video evidence of it. But the reality is this. So what you'll see when I'm cut, cutting these threads is when they're loose, they're still quite um, bouncy um, and quite thick. But if you pull them tight, it, the elasticity pulls them and makes them thinner. And then you can cut the ends close to the ground fabric and work that you've already done without actually going anywhere near your stitching. I say anywhere near your stitching, within a few millimetres of your stitching. Um, so that's quite good because it means you can work up fairly close to it or really close to it. I'm just going to push this outline back. There we go. Now let me just check what happens here. Yeah, so there's a line that goes down here, follows that, so we'll carry on and so I'm going to change a direction. Oh, a change of direction line. No, oh no, how frustrating. Mm. I'll say that it's not that frustrating in the grand scheme of things. There we go, right, here we go, we're back on the roll. So you've got a little gap here. I think we can fit one more in. Let's just try it and see. 
and then we're gonna have to yeah just and then we'll bring the next thread up at the bottom there because remember when you do your second row of stitching that will pull those threads into position oh look at that and so therefore i left a massive gap in between there so i can push it back this is the great thing about embroidery and the elasticity and the structure of fibers and yarn right so we're going to make a nice diagonal line down here like we did up the top there Um, no! Oh dear. Let's see, is that better? I've done it again. Honestly, what are the odds of that? I'm not very good at stats and um, things like that, but seriously. Right. Okay, we're on a roll. Although maybe I shouldn't speak too soon. Oh, that's changed direction. I don't like that. Cloth. Nope, I'm going to have to cut it this time. There are some fibres. Um, just poking out the top, making it more difficult. It worked 99% of the time, that's brilliant. There we go. Right, so I'm going to cheat a bit here, because I know that I've left a massive gap. Massive in relative terms. So I'm just going to go back and fill this area in here. I've not noticed this on the bare tapestry, but there are lots and lots of areas I've not studied yet. So um, you can imagine that happening, can't you? Um, right, um, so we've talked about length of thread. Oh yes, on the um, five stitches uh, video, someone asked, could I explain the, the colours that I use? So basically, oh, I've done it again, look. Basically, those colours um, I chose uh, in order for them to stand out when I was working the stitching on the how-to video. So um, some of the colours you will see being used across um, this recreation project, but other colours um, you won't, weren't used on the Bayer Tapestry. Um, and I used three different um, colours, one for each layer of stitching when I was um, working the laden couch work because I wanted you to be able to see um, the different layers of stitching clearly uh, on um, the bare tapestry all the original stitching all the layers are worked in the same color you do see different um, colors on later silk versions of um, of laden couch so that seems to be something that came in later um, possibly with the change of um, from wool to silk but Obviously, we're going on with the surviving evidence here. So that could mean that other hangings or other pieces from earlier in the period also use variation in colours, but we've got no evidence for that. Okay, so we've finished that base layer. So we're going to work um, our second layer at 90 degrees. Um, just having a look at... 
uh, I've got a sneaky list um, of questions that um, I thought I could answer during this video to the side. So that's what I've just been looking at. Um, someone's mentioned thimbles, and I know there was a whole conversation about thimbles um, in the comments of um, one of the videos. So we do have evidence for thimbles for later in the for the, the medieval period. Um, there's no evidence for the use of thimbles as we know them today from um, our period, the early medieval period in in what's now England. Um, we do have needle holders, um, needle cases, and um, things like that, and uh, obviously scissors and pouches that they were kept in, but we don't have any evidence for thimbles. Um, so that's one main reason why I'm not using a thimble on, on this particular project. Also, um, sorry, I'm not happy with the lag, that line. Uh, with this particular type of stitching, you don't really need a thimble, actually, because the fabric is, the weave of the fabric is op quite open, so therefore the threads and the needles go through uh, without you needing to apply a lot of pressure on, on the needle. Um, and as a result, you really don't need a thimble. Also, I don't know if you can see this or not, the end of the needles is quite rounded. They're not as sharp and pokey as a lot of modern needles are nowadays. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, the thimbles. Lost my needle, there we go. So when you're placing your stitches on your final layer, these little holding stitches that hold everything in place, you don't want to make them too close because what you will find is that you your stitches um, on some rows, they get so close together that you don't have a gap in between um, and it can look really um, untidy. So just um but then again of course you don't want them too far apart because then they're not doing their job and they're not create as uh, holding everything in place and they're not cr also doing the job of creating the right visual look But you'll find when you're if you're working that um, some areas need them closer together than others. So if you're doing I I don't know for example the planks of the ship um, something like that you don't want them too far apart either because then that will look daft and it'll look as if water could get into the ship between the planks of wood.
So it's all really about experience and intuition, really. Um, and that understanding of not only how your materials work, um, but also what the finished piece is going to look like. And I just find that sort of thing fascinating. It's not just about the finished article. It's about what's going on in the embroiderer's mind and the decisions that um, she, in, this, in, in these instances, or evidence points to um, embroiderers in the early medieval England being female. Um, so, yeah, I just find all of that really fascinating and interesting. And it also adds that humanity to these objects. They're not just objects. They're actually an interaction between material and person. Uh, right, let's cut this blue one off now. There we go. Uh, so you'll have noticed the eagle-eyed among you that I've just gone from the bottom here up to the top here. And you do find that um, they pass the thread along not huge areas, but smaller areas to get from one working area to the other. So um, we're okay doing that. All right, let me just check the angle of this. Yep, so we're going up in this way, all the way across. We're not changing direction um, on this swirly bit here. Oh, we're going to go like this. Right, I think we're coming to the end of our hour now. So I'm going to stop here. I know we're just starting this next bit, but I'm going to, I'll finish this in the meantime. And then I'm going to stop here, give you guys a break and a breather. And then when we come back for the next session, we'll be working on these bits down here. So as always, thank you very much for joining me on this. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Any questions or comments, pop them in the box below. Um, and if you've been doing some craft work with me, yay, great. If not, I hope you had a nice cuppa or coffee and a slice of cake or something. Um, and I'll see you next time. Bye.